Everybody, okay, great. Welcome to Xavier University's Energy Justice, leading the way to a third industrial revolution with our honored guest speaker, Jeremy Rifkin. I'm Nancy Berteau, professor of economics and faculty co-chair of Xavier's Sustainability Committee. And we are defining energy justice as environmentally sustainable forms of energy that are ecologically sound as well as economically advantageous for all members of society and especially those that are the least well off. This program is sponsored by Xavier Sustainability Committee and the Brueggemann Center for Dialogue with the following co-sponsors. The Senior Administrative Fellow for Sustainability, Kathleen Smythe, where are you? Wave at us, there you are, okay. Uh, the Philosophy, Politics, and the Public Program, anybody from there? Wave, there we go, okay. Um, Cincinnati's Green Umbrella, I saw, I saw Brewster, where are you Brewster Rose, there he is, okay, very good. Uh, Ohio Citizen Action, anybody here from there? Ohio Citizen, there we go, excellent. Uh, the Sierra Club, Sierra Club. It's gotta be a Sierra Club member here at least. There we go, members, we'll, we'll claim you, okay? Uh, the Environmental Community Organization, ECO, ECO, nobody? Okay, uh, the Greater Cincinnati Energy Alliance, Jeremy Faust, where are you? He's coming, if he's not here, he's late, okay? Um, and the Green Group, anybody from the Green Group? All right, okay, see, I call you, see, when you, Sign up as a co-sponsor, you better show up or you're gonna get called out like this. Thanks to one and all. Uh, to use a green umbrella phrase, Cincinnati is greener than you think. Under the leadership of Larry Falcon. I know I saw Larry, wave Larry, there he is. Okay. <laughs> Director of the City of Cincinnati's Office of Environment and Sustainability and the Office of Sustainability Coordinator, Steve Johns. Did Steve make it? We love him, even if he didn't make it. I know he has said he had kid issues, right? Um, Cincinnati is active in air quality, brownfield redevelopment, climate protection, energy management, environmental compliance, environmental justice, green roof loans, and recycling. Of special note for an energy justice event is that Cincinnati, this year, won the EPA's Green Power Community of the Year Award as the first major city in the US to provide 100% renewable electric power to its residents and small businesses, giving the city a number six national ranking in green power purchasing. Now, as we all know, Mark Twain said, when the world ends, I wanna be in Cincinnati because everything comes there 10 years later. Now that has now been turned on its head by Larry Falcon and his group. Uh, some examples of Xavier's recent sustainability initiatives and accomplishments. Inclusion of Xavier in the Princeton Review's Guide to Green Colleges. Xavier's receipt of a Green Advocacy Award from the Cincinnati Business Courier. The startup of three new undergraduate programs in sustainability. Economics, Sustainability and Society. Sustainability, Economics and Management. Land, Farming and Community. Approval of a Master's Degree in Urban Sustainability and Resilience that will start in the fall. A series of interdisciplinary field trips with eight different classes participating this year. Exhibits in our new Sustainability Heroes Gallery on display in Fenwick. A sustainability team's substantive input to the design process for the renovation of our main academic building, Alter Hall, to begin soon. Plans for a new integrated energy study that were begun after our visit from Amory Lovins in the fall, and many more. Our program tonight will feature a presentation by Jeremy Rifkin, followed by an opportunity for questions from you. We will wrap up by about 8.40, and there'll be an opportunity for book signings after the event. We will be selling books uh, in the uh, lobby there. Please note also that there is a free town hall next Monday, same place, same time, 7 p.m., on building sustainable local communities in an age of globalization which we consider is really a follow-on to this, so we really hope a lot of you will come out for that. Now, uh, Dr. James Buchanan, director of the Brueggemann Center for Dialogue, will introduce our speaker. Good evening, everyone. How's everybody? Thanks for being out tonight. Um, again, one of the things that we're trying to do with the Sustainability Committee, the Brueggemann Center, and a lot of our partners here in Cincinnati, both at the university and, 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 and beyond, is really look at, in some ways, how we move Cincinnati into the third industrial revolution. 
Um, I work, the Brueggemann Center works with Larry on the three conference, and I understand from an email we're getting ready to meet again about next year's sometime soon. So there's a lot that's going on. I, I know a lot of you are, are involved in those in various ways. Continue to do that. Get your neighbors involved. Get your kids involved um, because it really is about the future. Let me just get a hand. How many students are here tonight? That's great, thanks. Um, l let me just give you a little bit about Jeremy. I'm not gonna waste a lot of time because it's better listening to him than listening about him. And uh, his, his bio is so long and so prestigious that you could almost do a talk on that. He is, he is um, a best-selling author of 19 books on the impact of scientific and technological changes on the economy the workforce, society, and the environment. They've been translated into more than 35 languages. They're used in hundreds of universities, corporations, and government agencies around the world. He is the founder and president of the Foundation for Economic Trends, which is located in Bethesda, Maryland, which examines the economic, environmental, social, and cultural impacts of the technology. Um, I've been reading Jeremy's work since the mid-80s, uh, Declarations of a Heretic and Algony. Um, his The End of Work was an important book. One of my favorites is Time Wars. Um, the Empathetic Society is a very important work as well. Um, I've known him for about 20 years. I've heard him lecture numerous times. Uh, he is he's a true visionary. And for the students that are, that are here, I'll say what I said this afternoon to those students. You need to be looking at what you're going to hook your wagon to. What are, what's the future for you? What, what are you looking at in terms of where you're going with your career, your life, and the world that you're going to be running? Jeremy has got one part of the vision that I think should be guiding a lot of those decisions. So look at that, take it to heart, listen to him, read his works and the other kind of the people that he draws upon to do it. So without further ado, help me welcome to Xavier University, Jeremy Rifkin. Good evening, everybody. Does anyone recall the last time I was here? I believe it was 25 years ago, so I'm really the oldest guy here. <laughs> it's about 25 years ago. There were actually still Jesuits here teaching. I remember that. Okay. Let me start with an anecdote. When Angela Merkel became Chancellor of Germany, she asked me to come to Berlin in the first few weeks of her new government to help her address the question, how do we grow the German economy and create jobs in the 21st century? Now, remember as we sit here in the United States, Germany is the most robust industrial country per person in the entire world. That was a big task. When I got to Berlin, the very first question I asked the Chancellor is, Madam Chancellor, how, how do you grow the German economy, the European Union economy, the global economy in the last stages of a great energy era. That's the conundrum facing every single country in the world today. The second industrial revolution based on fossil fuel energies is sunsetting. It's clear. Fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas, shale gas, tar sands, these are not sunrise energies. They've matured. Their prices keep going up on world markets. Their prices are volatile and creating instability. And now all the technologies of the 20th century based on those energies, like centralized electrification, the internal combustion engine, have exhausted their productivity potential. There's almost no breath left in their S-curve. They're moribund technologies. 
And finally, we need to remember that this entire civilization is made out of fossil fuels. We grow our food in petrochemical fertilizers and pesticides. Virtually all of our construction materials in this room are made out of or embedded with fossil fuels. Our pharmaceutical products are still primarily made out of petrochemicals. Our power, our transport, our heat, our light, our synthetic fabrics, it's all fossil fuels. In fact, I, I often muse what future generations will think of us if we do survive this moment. And I don't say that to be entertaining. I'm not sure if we will or not. But if we do, what might the human race think of us in 500,000 years from now? They're going to look back at this period in history, this little blip, and there'll be nothing left of an historical record here. The monuments will be gone. The great cities will be gone. They'll only have one indication we were here. They're going to see our ecological footprint in the geological record. And they're going to say, oh, way back 500,000 years ago, they were the oil people. We had the Bronze Age, the Iron Age. These people lived off carbon deposits. They created a great short-lived civilization and almost took us to the end. As the sunset moves on fossil fuels, we have rising unemployment, a slowing of GDP, instability, political unrest, in a world that wakes up every day saying, how much worse can it get? This is an economic crisis, and as bad as it is, it's not the real story. Now, this economic crisis has given rise to a much more profound crisis. We have a species crisis. After two centuries, two industrial revolutions, we have spewed massive amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere, burning all the carbon to create this entire civilization. And we're now paying the entropy bill. Where are my engineers? Let me see you tonight. I always feel comfortable. Come on, raise your hands. I, now I feel good. You know you cannot escape the second law of thermodynamics. This is not a metaphor. We are paying the bill. All of that spent energy, the CO2 from creating everything from agriculture to construction to the cars we ride, it's all up there in the atmosphere blocking the sun's heat from getting off this planet. It's as profoundly simple as that. How bad is climate change? It is so much worse than you know. Those reports that come out from the UN are all watered down after all the countries take a poke at them. I was uh, in Paris when the last UN report, the fourth report, came out. It was published in Paris by the UN Climate Group. 2,500 scientists, all the major countries in the world, all the academies of science. And at that time, President Chirac asked me to come there. My job uh, during the publication was to ask the business community, where do we go from here? And the first thing I had to admit is <laughs> I got it wrong for 30 years. Uh, some of you remember a book called Entropy back in 1980 where we talked for the first time about this crisis. I continue to underestimate the speed of the feedback loops. This is terrifying. And let me say what's really frightening about climate change that is not well known in the public. And Al Gore did a great job. I wish he'd explain actually, though, what climate change actually does. It changes the water cycle of the Earth. That's what this is all about. We're the watery planet. We go to other planets. The first thing we ask, is there water? It's all about water here. For every one degree that the temperature goes up on this planet from industrial-induced climate change, the atmosphere is absorbing 7% more precipitation from the ground. Because of the heat, it just sucks it right up to the atmosphere and we get more concentrated water and precipitation, this changes the entire hydrological cycle of the Earth in one moment of time. We're getting more extreme water events everywhere in the world. More bitter winter snows and longer winter seasons. Sound familiar? More dramatic spring flooding everywhere in the world. More prolonged summer droughts. Think California. There's no water left. How do we repopulate the entire western part of the United States? We're seeing more category three, four, and five hurricanes, more typhoons, more tsunamis. Our ecosystems developed over millions of years based on certain regi water regimes. They can't readjust this quickly.
to a complete change in the water cycle of the earth in one moment of time. They're under stress and they are collapsing. How bad is it? All of our scientific studies now show we are actually in the sixth extinction event. And I see the New Yorker writer now has a book on the bestseller that's called The Sixth Extinction. If you read The Third Industrial Revolution, we had some information on it. I'm sure glad she put that book out. We've had five extinction events in the last 450 million years on this planet, five wipeouts in the geological record. Every time we had a mass extinction event, there was a tipping point in the chemistry of the planet, in the climate of the planet, and it goes quick once you hit that tipping point in mass extinction. And on the average, it took about 10 million years each time to recover the biodiversity we lost. We're in the sixth extinction event. All the studies show it. We're there on our watch. And our scientists say that we could lose somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of all the life forms that inhabit this little oasis in this barren universe by the end of this century. That's a wipeout. As my wife says, we're not grabbing the historic moment. We might be there intellectually, but we're not there emotionally, or we would be in emergency mode. You know, we're the youngest species. We're the babies. You know, we've only been here 175,000 years, anatomically modern humans. The horses must laugh at us. We are the babies. 99.5% of all the species of life that have ever been on this planet have come and gone, 99.5 percent. It's the height of hubris to believe that somehow we can do what we've done to this earth and still survive the mayhem. There's no guarantee. I don't know if we're too late, but I act as if we're not too late, but we are right at the cusp. There's no other way to act at this point in time. So now we have a great global economic crisis. Certainly the second industrial revolution has on life support. You can smell it. You can feel it. I chair a group of uh, companies from all over the world. They know. In the boardrooms, they know. They actually know that we are in a dying economic regime. But what we're not acknowledging is now that economic regime is taking us into a species crisis and an, unex an experiment that we have no idea what the outcome is. And it's happening on the watch of your grandchildren, your children, right now. So what do we do? We need a new economic vision for the world. It has to be compelling. We need a new economic game plan for that vision, and it has to be deliverable. And the game plan has to move as quickly in the developing countries as in the industrialized nations. We have to be off carbon, not low carbon, not clean tech, off carbon off carbon in every aspect of our lives within 30 years. That's my sense of what we need to do if we have any hope of beating the clock here and mitigating the worst excesses of climate change, hopefully getting us down to stabilizing at under 400 parts per million carbon. We really have to go to 350. It is daunting, really, a Herculean task. But it can be done. What we need to do is step back for a moment and ask the question, how do the great economic revolutions in history occur? If we know how they occur, we can get a road map here in Cincinnati and in every other community in the world as to what you and I need to do right now to move us into a new stage of the human journey. Now, if we look back at history, the great economic revolutions come about when two phenomena emerge. And it doesn't happen very often. The great economic paradigm shifts, we change our energy regimes. We're a very inventive species. We've had many different energy regimes. Ener new energy regimes increase the flow of energy, allowing us to cohere in larger social units, differentiate labor skills, integrate ourselves in bigger communities. But it's the complexity of those energy regimes that then require a concomitant communication revolution that's agile enough to manage and coordinate the new energies. All through history, when communication revolutions converge with energy revolutions, and I should also say, and then bring about new forms of logistics and transport, it changes the economic paradigm. Communication, energy, transport. It's a social prothesis. Every human being requires communication, a form of energy, and a source of mobility. So does a society. So we create these great technology platform changes. Basic one is communication and energy, and then a form of transport and logistics. 
Together, they allow us to cohere in bigger social units, extension of our individual human lives. Let me give you an example. Let me say um, the Third Industrial Revolution only covers the 19th and 20, 21st century. If you are interested, the book before that, The Empathic Civilization, traces these paradigm shifts all the way through history and how they converge with new shifts in consciousness. I warn you, it's 660 pages. My wife said, are you out of your mind? No one is under 25 is going to read 660 pages. They won't even read 660 characters. But I hope she's wrong. And I want every student here to prove me wrong. I'm not saying you should take the book to the beach. <laughs> but let's start in the 19th century. We had a very powerful convergence of communication and energy, a first industrial revolution. Steam power printing was a big deal. We went from manual print presses to steam power printing in the 19th century. And all of a sudden, we could produce massive amounts of print material cheap, quick, and efficiently, and lower the transaction cost. It was as important then as the internet is for communication today. Then we introduced the telegraph. But when we introduced printing in the telegraph, we then had to create public school systems all over the world to educate the workforce in literacy so that they could attend to the more complex jobs of an industrial civilization. An illiterate workforce could not have managed the first industrial revolution. So steam power printing, public schools, allowed us to organize a complex coal-powered, rail-driven, steam-run urban industrial revolution, 19th century. 20th century, another convergence of communication energy and transport, second industrial revolution, centralized electricity, especially the telephone, then radio and television, allowed us to manage a very complex and dispersed automobile and oil era in a suburban society, a mass consumer culture. And now that second industrial revolution is dying, not coming back. We are fortunate, however. We are on the cusp of a new convergence of communication energy. Listen, this doesn't always happen. In the 6th century, Rome fell. There was nothing to replace it. Rome was based on its energy regime, was uh, agriculture across the Mediterranean. It provided, what, 75% of the tax revenue to maintain the Roman civilization. And they denuded the, so the soil, destroyed the agricultural base, and it was over before the hordes came to the gate. And there was nothing to replace this complex matrix they had for another six centuries until we introduced wind which people don't know, wind and water mills in the 12th and 1300s in Europe. We're very fortunate. We are on the cusp of a new convergence of communication energy. It's real, it's here, and it's moving quickly in Europe and now in China in the last 12 months. We had a very powerful communication revolution in the last 20 years, the personal computer and the internet. What's so interesting about the internet is the way it's organized. I grew up on centralized communication, one-to-many, top-down, radio, television, newspapers, magazines. The internet is not centralized and top-down. It's designed to be distributed and collaborative in nature. It isn't vertically integrated to create economies of scale. It's laterally integrated, peer-to-peer, -to, -peer, to create economies of scale. Know this, and we understand the beginnings of a new economic paradigm shift and a new economic system that's going to be hybrid with capitalism and may even dominate by the second half of this century. This communication revolution, the internet, is distributed, it's collaborative, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, it's laterally scaled, economies of scale. And what's so interesting about this is how fast this came in. It shows you the, the creativity of the human species. We're the most social creature. We got the biggest neocortex. The Brits got it wrong during the Enlightenment when they said we seek autonomy. We seek companionship and community and larger integrations. So this World Wide Web came on in 1990. If I had said to you in 1990 that 23 years later, one third of the human race, with cheap cell phones they give away and cheap desktop computers, some for $25, would be sending audio, video, and text to each other at the speed of light, and that a third of the human race could get the entire knowledge of the world in three seconds on Google, and if, if they were irritated, it might take maybe 10 seconds, and that 
one billion young people would be in Facebook and the biggest family album in history, and 500 million people would be gossiping about being at the grocery store with each other every single day on Twitter, and we'd be doing this, my friends, a third of the human race, at near zero marginal cost. What would you have said if I told you that in 1990? We did it. Two decades. That's only half the story. Keep in mind what I just said about zero marginal cost. Marginal costs are the cost of producing an additional unit of a good and service after the fixed cost. So you have to have the fixed cost paid back. But even with the fixed cost, the marginal cost of each additional unit, if it heads towards zero, it's free. You're going up on your cell phone and your computer, and it costs you almost nothing, except you're paying your monthly fee, because the infrastructure's in. And you're sending videos to each other and audio and blogs, news, et cetera. This is half the story. What's happened now is this internet communication revolution, which is distributed, collaborative, peer-to-peer, -peer, and laterally scaled, is now beginning to converge with a new energy regime, distributed energies, which have to be organized collaboratively, and they're peer-to-peer. -peer. They scale laterally, not vertical integration. What are distributed energies? Well, let me compare them to the energies we know, elite energies. Coal, oil, tar sands, heavy oil, uranium. These are elite energies. Go home today after this, look around your backyard. Pretty good chance you don't have any of these energies in your backyard. Maybe over in Kentucky you'd have coal, but you don't have much here. These energies are only found in a few places. They require huge military investments to secure them, massive geopolitical commitments to manage them, and tremendous infusions of finance capital to create the vertical integration to get them from the wellhead or underground to you and I. These are the most centralized, elite, vertically integrated energies in all of history, and they're sunsetting. What are distributed energies? Go home tonight, look around your neighborhood, you have all the energy you will ever need till the end of history. The sun shines all over this beautiful little planet every single day. One hour of sunlight provides enough energy to power the entire global economy over and over for an entire year, no problem. The wind blows across this beautiful planet every single day. 20% of that wind harness gives us seven times more power than our economy will ever need. Underneath this planet, right here, under the ground, and everywhere on the planet is a hot geothermal core. That's the rest of the sun. Still hasn't cooled off. We can take up that geothermal heat at a moment's notice for energy. On the coastal regions, the ocean tides and waves are coming in every day. It's a source of energy. I'm always amused when people say, you think we can provide enough energy to run this economy with the sun? Would someone please explain that this is from the sun? Everything from this planet is from the sun. All our energy is from the sun. If the sun doesn't do it, we're doomed. So we have all of this distributed energy that's found in every square inch of the world in some frequency or proportion. Enough energy to provide for our species till kingdom comes. The European Union, the European Union, let me talk a little about it. We, there's so much EU bashing in this country, it just surprises me. We like to say, oh, the European Union, I'd love to go there on vacation, but it's history. It's a museum. They're gone. Let me remind my American colleagues that the 27 member states of the European Union, which is a political union, their GDP exceeds our GDP today, yesterday, and for the last 10 years. They have the highest GDP of any political jurisdiction in the world. Surprising? Yeah. They have the highest GDP. Just go look it up, GDP. You'll see the EU, and then you'll see the US. They're a political union. The EU has made a formal commitment to a five-pillar third industrial revolution infrastructure, a general purpose technology platform that can bring us into a new economic paradigm. I was privileged to develop this, this plan with and for the EU. It took us 11 years. It's our formal plan. It was endorsed by the European Parliament in 2007. It's working its way through the European Commission. It's in our 2020 plan, our 2030, and our 2050 plan. And by 2050, we are over 80 percent renewable energy and off carbon. Some countries are further ahead than others. Denmark and Germany, they're all the way to the end already. They're moving. Some other countries, not so fast. 
Here are the five pillars. Pillar one, the EU has a formal commitment to 20% renewable energy by 2020. That's not a suggestion. That's a mandate. Every community has to reach that goal. That means a third of the electricity has to be green. Pillar two, how do we collect energy that's distributed? Well, our first thoughts, embarrassingly enough, were, oh, this is easy. We're going to go to Italy, Spain, and Greece. They got all the sun. We're going to put in these huge solar complexes, put in a high voltage electricity line, ship it out to Europe. Ireland's got all that offshore wind. We're going to put in these huge wind parks, put a high voltage line, ship it off to Europe. The Norwegians will give us the hydro. You get the drift. Now, let me say none of us oppose these more concentrated uses of what are essentially distributed energies. They're easy. They're quick. They're low-lying fruit. We don't oppose them. But what we learned, you can't manage, we can't manage an entire continent with these spotty, <laughs> big, huge parks. And then you have to send the electricity long distances and you lose it in the transmission. We don't oppose it, but it's supplementary. We begin to ask the question, if energies, are, renewable energies are everywhere, why aren't we collecting them everywhere? We were thinking 19th and 20th century centralized energies. Pillar two, buildings. Buildings use the most energy. They create the most CO2. By the way, does anyone know what the number two cause of industrial-induced climate change is after buildings? Transports three, cattle, meat production. When I wrote Beyond Beef in 1990 suggesting that, the cattle industry said, Mr. Rifkin, you are out of your mind. We're going to put you in an institution. <laughs> now we understand it's number two, but actually what we're going to find is beef production and animal husbandry and agriculture is probably number one. It's coming in quick. We don't spend any time on two. We talk about buildings one and transport three because not even our political leaders, not one single head of state, including the ones I advise, have made one statement about the number two cause of climate change. I understand that the city of Cincinnati, I believe, is the first city that's actually put that on the agenda in the United States. Is that correct? Formally on the agenda. This city, Cincinnati, Ohio. So. Buildings, buildings, buildings. We have 191 million buildings in the European Union. Homes, offices, factories, barns, and sheds. Our goal is to convert every single existing building in Europe to your own personal green micropower plant. Get the sun off the roof, get the wind off the side of the building, get the geothermal heat from under the building, convert your garbage energy in the building. The new buildings are positive power. We've got them, they're up. Bouygues is in my group, the Great French Construction Company. They've got a beautiful positive power office complex in Paris. It sucks up so much sun alone it provides all of its needs and sends surplus back to the grid, and it only took a few years for payback. This is, once you can do it, anyone can do it. As soon as they did it, 25 universities did it. It's easy once you know how to do it. This isn't rocket science. Pillar two jumpstarts the economy because it's always about construction. New infrastructure revolutions are about construction because you're spending 20, 30 years redeveloping your infrastructure. We're talking about millions of jobs and thousands of SMEs because we have to retrofit every building. First, we have to get them efficient because they're leaking. Then we put the installation for power on them. So the, ret the retrofits are extremely labor intensive. A lot of jobs, a lot of businesses. Let me make a parallel here. In 1970, there were a few mainframe computers, and they cost a huge amount of money, and the big companies were using the data. Then Steve Jobs and a couple of kids in the garage. I don't know why it's always in the garage. I mean, but in the garage, they create the personal computer. Today, a third of the human race, you all have them right now on you, sending audio, video, and text at near zero marginal cost. Here's the parallel. Today, we have a few big power and utility companies in every region of the world. They generate centralized power with nuclear and fossil fuels. We buy it. But already in Europe, we have millions and millions of households and small businesses, consumer and producer co-ops, small, providing huge amounts of green electricity. In 10 years from now, we're going to have tens of millions of buildings all over the world creating some of their own green electricity. In 20 years from now, we're going to have several hundred million existing and new buildings producing their own micropower in the world. And the reason I know that, we've done the numbers in my global consulting group. Um, Ray Kurzweil's done the numbers at MIT. He's now the head of engineering over at Google. And we've come up with the same. We're on an exponential curve here. And that's what the energy industry didn't realize, but now they're terrified. When Watson was head of IBM in the 50s, he said, we'll need five computers. 
They're just too expensive, but five or six will do it. We didn't understand exponential curves with computer chips. When Intel created that chip, and we could double the information in half the cost every two years, that exponential curve allowed us to take computing with the chips down to almost zero marginal cost. Now we're seeing it in solar and wind. Swanson's law in solar, we're doubling the knowledge and capacity, halving the cost every two years. We've been doing it for 20 years. Same with wind. We're now theoretically at that 20th day. Let me explain exponential curves. I got taken when I was 13. There was a kid across the street, Butchie O'Connor. We were always competitive, and he won every single contest that we ever had. He said, I'm going to give you a little uh, a proposition. I'll give you a million bucks, or I'm going to give you one dollar, and you can double it every day for 30 days. What do you want? I said, give me the million. What are you, crazy? He said, I got you again. Take out a pencil and paper. I took it out, and he humiliated me. I did one dollar, first day, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512. I said, I got this beat. About the 18th day, I said, well, wait a minute. Something's going on here. <laughs> Something's wrong. I, I got to go back and look at the numbers. By the 30th day, I was at a billion dollars. It seems completely contrary and counterintuitive. We're on an exponential curve, and we're high, theoretically, we're around that 23rd day on solar and wind. Uh, it used to be $66 a watt. It's now 66 cents a watt. It's going to be like nothing in a few years. Yeah, $66 a watt in 1978, 66 cents today. So, we are going to begin to see millions and millions and then hundreds of millions of people creating their own green electricity at near zero marginal cost. You see, that, that energy is free. The sun off your roof is free. The wind off your building is free. The heat under the ground is free. You have to pay back the fixed costs, but they're getting cheaper and cheaper with exponential curves. Ray Kurzweil did the numbers, I said. He says six, eight more doublings. We've been doubling every two years. 16 years, we're in. I think it may go a little slower, but we should get there within the same curve as we did computing 20 years. We're already much of in within 10, 15 years from now. We should be there if there isn't some real blowbacks. There's a lot of powerful interests that don't want this to happen. But you know what? The music industry, they didn't understand file sharing in music, let me tell you. Well, evidently, some of you young people here had nothing else to do in high school, a lot of free time, you didn't go outside, so you figured out new software so you could create ways to share music for free. And the music companies called it cheating, and you called it sharing. That's the paradigm shift. And evidently, they tried encryption, they tried legislation, none of it worked, and you're all sharing music. And the music industry went to its knees. And the newspapers didn't understand the blogosphere. And they're being crippled and they're going out of business with the blogs. And the Encyclopedia Britannica couldn't fathom a free Wikipedia, and they're on the skids. I could go on and on. The entertainment industry didn't anticipate YouTube. As powerful as these interests are, the telecommunication companies, the entertainment industry, all of these companies, the technology is so distributed, so collaborative, so democratizing that it'll be pirated one way or the other because it's just too good for the general welfare. All right. Pillar three is storage. We got a problem. The sun isn't always shining. Sometimes the wind blows at night. We need the electricity during the day. I know there are a lot of local businesses here that are into solar and wind here tonight. These are intermittent energies. We got to store them. I favor all storage technologies. Flow batteries, flywheels, batteries, capacitors, water pumping, air compression, we like them all. But at the EU, I should say, we put a lot of our focus at the center of storage. We like them all, but we like hydrogen as a central carrier too. It's the basic element of the universe. It's what we're made out of. It's modular. We can use it in our apartment building or a big complex. The technology's there, it just has to scale. But we like them all. So here's how it works. Let's say in your home you've got a solar panel on the roof. You're generating some green electricity. If you don't need all of it, take the surplus green electricity and put it in water. So then it'll force the hydrogen out of the water to the side of the tank, like high school chemistry. The anode, the cathode, hydrogen goes to the side of the tank. When the sun isn't shining on your solar panel, you simply take that hydrogen you collected and put it through a fuel cell back to electricity. Engineers, this is a tiny thermodynamic conversion loss compared to the loss in conversion of bringing fossil fuels and nuclear from the beginning to the end at every step of the conversion. Pillar four, this is the one that brings the communication revolution together with the energy revolution. 
We're using off-the-shelf internet and IT technology in Europe, and we're transforming the uh, transmission grid to an energy internet. It acts just like the internet. Same technology. So when millions of homes and offices and factories are creating small amounts of green electricity, storing it in hydrogen, like we store media in digital, then if you don't need some of that green electricity, or I don't need it at a given moment, we can share our surplus across an energy internet with our software all the way from the Irish Sea to the doorsteps of Russia, just like we create information, store it in digital, share it online, same technology. The internet, together with distributed energies, power to the people literally and figuratively. Last pillar is transport and logistics. Remember I said you have to have a form of communication, a form of energy, and a form of mobility to run a society, just like an individual. Electric vehicles are here. Fuel cell cars, trucks, and bus running on hydrogen will be out by all six major companies, Toyota, Daimler in our group, uh, uh, Renault Nissan in our group, GM, they're all going to be out in 2016. You'll be able to plug in your electric and fuel cell vehicle anywhere where there's a parking space, there'll be a plug. Every parking space across the country. Plug into the distributed energy internet, get green electricity for your car, bus, or truck, train. Or let's say you're at work. Your computer is on, monitoring the price of the electricity on the grid. If the price goes up, you can program your computer so while you're working, your car will sell its green electricity back to the grid. We're already doing that in Europe. It's not academic. If you go to Brussels near the Parliament, you'll see the little electric fuel stations. They're all there. Not on a big scale, but they're coming in. These five pillars alone are meaningless components. They're nothing. It's only when we put them together and phase them in simultaneously so that one works to the advantage of the other symbiotically, then we have a general purpose technology platform engineers, an infrastructure for a new economic paradigm. President Obama. <laughs> He blew it. I voted for him twice. I think I, I really like the man. I think that he really wanted a green economy. He still does. It. Certainly John Kerry, I know, does want a green economy. It didn't happen. They spent billions and billions of dollars of U.S. stimulus money, tax money, on standalone siloed pilot projects. They'd throw money to an electric car factory in one state, a solar panel factory in another state, all isolated. These are infrastructure revolutions. They require public-private deployment. The second industrial revolution, it wasn't enough for Henry Ford to have the automobile. It would have gone nowhere without centralized electricity because that gave him electric power tools so he could bring the work to the workers and put out a cheap car for everybody. And then you needed the gasoline and oil pipelines to be coming in with public-private sponsorship. And then we needed the highways and road systems to be laid out. Then we needed centralized telephones moving to the rural areas to create suburban connection for the new economies. It all came in over a period of 50 years together, starting with the automobile and ending with the interstate highway system and the suburban build out of the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. It's obvious. But in a country that believes that the government can do nothing and should do nothing and shouldn't exist, half the country, what do you expect? I was amused. I spend most of my time, I'm not in the U.S. that much, but in Europe, in Asia. When President Obama said, you didn't build that, I was shocked at the response. What he was saying to the SMEs is that the way you become successful, you have to plug into an infrastructure. Who do you think builds the public schools that educate people, the sewer systems, uh, underwrites the telephones, the centralized electricity, the gasoline and oil pipelines? It goes on and on. The FHA mortgages. It goes on and on and on, and half the country is so dummy down, they don't understand that. Does any private business create infrastructure? No, that's what we do together because it's, it's an amenity that all of us benefit from. When we can't get ourselves to collectively put together an infrastructure, we're lost. We're second tier, and that's what's going on. Half the country. Not the whole country. Half the country. I'm going to let you in on a dirty little secret in economics. <laughs> You'll share this with your friends. What is the nature of productivity and growth? Now, you would think that would be the central thing that economics could tell us about, because economics is about productivity and growth. When Robert Solo won the Nobel Prize for economic growth theory in the 1980s, he let the little secret out. He said, well, we got a little problem. 
He said, when we track the Industrial Revolution year by year, we have a problem because we always believe productivity and growth is two-factor analysis. Better machines, better workers. The problem is when we track the Industrial Revolution with those two factors, they only account for 14% or so of the productivity and growth. So Robert Solow asked, where does the other 86% of productivity and growth come from? Nah, they don't know. Now, I teach at the Wharton School. It's the oldest business school in the world. I don't teach as much as I used to, but I taught the Advanced Management Program, the CEO program, for 16 years. We never talked about this. Nobody wants to talk about this. Are you surprised that no one need, knows where the other 86% of economic growth and productivity comes from? We now know, 20 years later. Let me tell you why we didn't know. When they penned economic theory in the 1700s during the Enlightenment, the big rage was Newton's physics. So everybody wanted to use Newton's metaphors, including the philosophers of economics. So Adam Smith readily said, I use Newton's physics as a guide. You know for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction? Aha! The invisible hand of supply and demand. For every action, there's an equal and opposite interaction between sellers and buyers. Baptist Say, the great French economic philosopher of the Enlightenment, you know the first law, uh, a body in motion stays in motion? Ah, he said, supply generates demand, which stimulates supply, which generates demand, and it's perpetual unless I'm interrupted by an outside force. All of economic theory, penned in the late 1700s, still used, is all based on Newton's physics as metaphor. There's only one thing wrong with this. Newton's physics has absolutely nothing to do with economics. I'm serious, nothing. That's why we've got an economic theory in practice that is now moribund. Economics is based on the laws of thermodynamics, engineers, the energy laws. They were invented by engineers and chemists in the late 19th century when they were studying energy flows and entropy losses in machines. First two laws of energy, and they once asked Albert Einstein, which laws of, of physics will be dethroned? He said, every one of them, including mine, except these two laws, because they're common sense. First law of energy, we've never created or destroyed energy. All the energy in the universe has been here since the Big Bang. We'll be here to the last whimper. We've never created or destroyed energy. Second law is we do change the form of energy, but it only goes in one direction, from order to disorder, from concentrated to dispersed, from hot to cold, from available to unavailable. Entropy is a measure of energy still there but unavailable. You have a piece of coal. You burn it. The energy is still there. It's now carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. It's not a piece of coal anymore, but it's all still there. But you can't get any useful work. Now, you could recycle, but it takes energy to recycle energy, and you always have an energy loss. Engineers, where are you again? You never break even. You always lose. When do you pay the bill? It's called climate change. 200 years of spewing CO2. The entropy's up there. It's not only not useful, it's now dysfunctional. So what does this have to do with the third industrial revolution? In the last 20 years, a new generation of physicists and economists who was trained in physics first have re-looked at productivity and growth. And they added a third factor. Machines, better workers, and engineers, the aggregate efficiency of useful work. It's something we gauge in economics. That is, when you embed energy into something, how much of the actual energy goes into making it useful versus the waste in making the conversion. So here's what, here's what economics is. We borrow energy from nature. It can be a rare earth, a metal. It can be a fossil fuel. Everything is energy, including materials. So we take that concentrated energy from the planet's earth, and every time we convert it and transform it across the value chain, we're using energy, embedding it in the good or service at each step. And every time we embed energy, we're losing some and wasting it by trying to get that value into the good or service. It's called the useful thermodynamic efficiency. Then all of those goods and services dishevel, go back to the earth, and they're recycled at an energy loss. That's all economics is. GDP is not a measure of wealth. It's a measure of debt. Absolutely. They got it totally backwards. So now we know that the other 86% of productivity and growth, by all the new studies, it's all thermodynamic efficiencies. And again, Henry Ford could have told you that. He said, those electric power tools increase my efficiency and productivity. I got out the cheap car. So when economists say to environmentalists, hey, more efficiency means slower growth, they have no idea what they're talking about. 
It's all about efficiencies. Increase your thermodynamic efficiencies, dramatically increase your productivity. What is productivity? The ability to get as optimum, optimum work with the minimum input of labor, energy, time, and capital. Now let me go through the next thing. Can you imagine something called extreme productivity? Well, we could optimize goods and services with almost no energy expended time, labor, and capital. There's a paradox in capitalist theory, not really disclosed up to now. Karl Marx missed it. Everybody kind of missed it. It's pretty interesting. The central thesis of capitalist theory, which I still teach, is that you have sellers and buyers. If demand goes up for a product, a seller will raise their price. If the seller raises the price too high and demand flogs off, they'll lower their price in order to go into balance. There's a caveat to general economic theory to account for the vibrancy of the economic system. That is, entrepreneurs are constantly, and I come from a family of entrepreneurs, constantly probing the system, looking for new tools and technologies that can increase their efficiencies, reduce their fixed and marginal costs, so they can put out cheaper products, win more consumers over, and get market share, right? Now, for long periods of time, whoever gets the market will try to keep a monopoly and block the new inventors, but eventually they break through, right? This is what's made capitalism great. The uh, vibrancy of creating new technologies, reduce the fixed and marginal costs so you can put out cheaper products, win market share, and actually a lot of workers and consumers end up better off. Those at the margins of the system, those we've exploited outside the system, they, they didn't get a good shake. But everybody inside the capitalist system, we really improved our way of life over two centuries at the expense of the planet and a lot of our fellow human beings, but we did well, a good percentage of us. Can you imagine a situation where the technology becomes so good that we enjoy extreme productivity? You see, our economists always believe you reduce your marginal cost, and the most efficient state is where you sell at your marginal cost because that's the best for everybody. They never anticipated the possibility of a technology revolution that could reduce marginal cost to near zero. When it goes to near zero, Goods and services can potentially be free if there's no monopoly to block them. Think music file sharing, YouTube videos, the blogosphere, et cetera. <clears throat> Napster was the first inkling of this paradigm shift. All the kids started sharing music on, and the entertainment industry went down. Then it hit the newspapers and the film industry. <clears throat> but economists thought this would only be kept to information goods. We can control it. And the theory was, we'll get a lot of stuff free. Everyone's getting things free now, right? But that freemium will allow us to create new opportunities in the business system so that we can then put out high-end premium goods and services so people will want those. Like the musicians say, I'll give all my music out free, but we'll get people to come to our concerts. Or the newspapers, like the New York Times, The Economist, say, we'll give out a certain amount of information free, but then some people will buy the premium services. Yes, but it's a smaller and smaller and smaller niche. As more and more stuff becomes free, Less is being bought. I'm in book publishing. I can tell you what's happened with ebooks and self published books and, uh, that are near zero marginal cost. Our industry's down, down, down. It's not coming back. Now, what happened in the information goods is now moving to other industries renewable energy and now 3D printing and manufacturing. It's broken through. Renewable energy, what terrifies the energy industry is the energy's free. The sun is free, the wind is free, the heat is free. You just got to pay back the fixed cost. But the minute you got that solar panel up, even when you haven't paid back the fixed cost, all, you're generating free energy right there. All you have to do is keep it dusted so it's clean. Same with the wind turbine, same with the heat pump. And so now in Germany, 25% of the electricity since the chancellor's come in is now green and nearly zero marginal cost. They're heading to 35% green electricity by 2020. And one million buildings are creating power right now. Now, the wholesale price has gone way down because of this, but the retail price has gone up and it's creating havoc in Germany because the utility companies are passing the, through the cost on these feed-in tariffs to the consumers in the rate bill. It's a short-term problem. But in the mid to long term, if you keep on this curve, it's all free energy. Imagine Germany, if we can get through this hump in 15 or 15 years, it's all nearly free energy like free information. Imagine plugging and playing into that if you're a business. But there's a problem now. It's disruptive. 
Let me talk about 3D printing. How many are aware of 3D printing now? By everyone now. Okay, this thing is so cool. <laughs> oh, God. The replicator. Star Trek. I guess all we have to do is watch Star Trek and watch every film and then just duplicate everything they said. Uh, so you have a 3D printer. You're using open source software because the hobbyists and they've kept it open just like file sharing and music and information and software. Very little intellectual property. The software in the printer is directing molten material to melt and then layer by layer create a three-dimensional complete whole product with moving parts. You know what kind of molten material they're using now? Gravel, rocks, sand, recycled plastic, and paper. It's almost free filament. All right? You have to pay for the machine. It's about 1200 bucks. They're only making simple things now, but it's going to get more complex just like computers and more, more cheap. So if you're a 3D printer, let's say in Senegal, and you plug in to the third industrial revolution infrastructure, you can produce your product with one-tenth of the materials because this is additive manufacturing. I taught subtractive manufacturing. You have a big hunk of material, centralized factory. You cut some of the material out, winnow it down, pare it down, put the final product together, throw a lot of it out, loss of thermodynamic energy efficiency. It's like French cooking. It's shamefully wasteful, but a beautiful product. And you know if you've done French cooking, you're throwing 90% of it away. The energy efficiency in the product is infinitesimally small. Okay? So with this manufacturing, you're building up the product. There's no loss. It's one whole. You're using one-tenth of the materials. It's called additive manufacturing. You're in Senegal. Open source printer. No intellectual property. One-tenth of the material using filament that's local, gravel, sand, recycled plastic. Then you can market on websites like Etsy in the third industrial revolution. The big boys, the big girls, they all had centralized marketing, radio, television. Who could afford that for global reach? Now you got a website like Etsy. How many of you use Etsy? Uh, Rob Kalin called me a few years ago out of nowhere. I had put him in my book, but he didn't even know. And he said, well, Mr. Rifkin, uh, I want to introduce myself. This kid was an NYU dropout. His parents must have gone ballistic. This kid dropped out of NYU. He wanted to make craft furniture in his Brooklyn apartment. So he makes the craft furniture, and then he forgot you have to get it out of the building and sell it. So he ended up with another guy, Matt Stinchin, who's a great guy, still with the company, and they put up a website. Eight years later, 900,000 small businesses connected to 60 million consumers a month. It's all free. So if you buy something, you connect right up with your own SME, and then you pay a small fee, the SME, to the website. Amazing. Near zero marginal cost advertising. Then you're powering your local 3D factory with your own green electricity from your own green co-op at near zero marginal cost. No price of oil or fossil fuels or nuclear power. And you're transporting in your vehicles that are electric vehicles. The Irby is out. It's already a three-printed vehicle, three-printer. Three but you can transport to market with your vehicle with your own electricity at near zero marginal cost. How can centralized, vertically integrated factories of the second industrial revolution compete with that? Where is this leading? Let me introduce you to something new. I have a, a book coming out in two weeks. I hope you look at it. Damn it, we're going to give you the first chapter away, unfortunately. But take a look. It's called the Zero Marginal Cost Society. I'm introducing it for the first time today. First time anywhere, actually. All right? It's coming out in the US and other countries starting this two weeks. Let me introduce the idea here. This third industrial revolution infrastructure, these five pillars, they give us three internets in one system, an, a communication internet, an energy internet, and a transport and logistics internet. They operate as a single system. And communication, energy transport, the prothesis. What's happening now with this third industrial revolution infrastructure is it's now moving to the next stage. We're no longer with an internet. We're with an internet of things. That's what's developed in the last six months. It's called the internet of things. Three internets in one. Communication, energy, logistics, one big system. It's lateral. It's open. It's neutral for everyone. And we're now taking that system and putting sensors to connect every device with every device with every human on the planet. So resources will have sensors on the ground, monitoring the environment, our, what's going on in the farming fields, uh, water, uh, the, the salinity of the water. We're going to be 
putting sensors, there already are, on production lines on what's happening in the factories. We're going to have, we already have sensors in the, in the stores. We have them in the distribution centers, the warehouses, the traffic on the road. There's now 3.5 billion sensors. By 2025, 100 trillion sensors. Now, I know what you're thinking. The real wild card here is how do we secure privacy, data privacy and security in a connected world? But the upside is we're now creating an Internet of Things that allows us to connect every human, every being, and every part of this planet in one neural network that's distributed and potentially democratic, open, neutral, if it isn't taken over by the monopolies, and I include the Googles and the Facebooks and the Twitters, and the tw along with the telecom and the cable companies and the energy companies. There's a struggle going on, a big struggle. But eventually, the democratization is so beneficial to the human race, it will win out, short of some catastrophic event. Just like the kids beat out file sh on file sharing and the blogosphere and with Wikipedia. So how does this work? With this Internet of Things, all of our environment, natural environment, human environment, is connected to these three internets and it's constantly feeding big data to everyone in this room because it's a net neutral network just like the internet. That means you can constantly get big data and on your own little app or mobile phone, use that big data with advanced analytics to create your own algorithms just like Facebook does in Google now. Actually, you can do it. You don't need to have fancy techno technology to do it. Your software will allow you to do it. You feed big data to yourself in your home, your small business, your neighborhood development company, your nonprofit organization to allow you to dramatically increase your thermodynamic efficiencies and dramatically increase your productivity with new software based on your algorithms and, and, and analytics so that you can get to near zero marginal cost on anything you're doing in the value chain. So think of it this way. The Internet allowed us, within 20 years, all of you have apps that allow you to create any information good you want and send it to everyone at near zero marginal cost, correct? Why would it be any more difficult to imagine 20 years now the Internet of Things allowing you and I to use the advanced analytics and algorithms with our apps to increase our efficiencies and be able to become prosumers and produce and share our own energy, 3D printed products and everything else at near zero marginal cost? It's the Internet of Things. It's an expansion of the Internet to include not just information but energy and goods. Yeah, it's wow. However, it's going to be a struggle, and there's no guarantee that there won't be tremendous, there is backlash now. The telecom companies, the cable companies are trying to end network neutrality. Facebook and Google has got intellectual patents up the kazoo. It's a struggle. But this is the democratization of everything. And this is going to be most beneficial in the developing world. The, what we learned with cell phones, well, it caught us by surprise in the business community because we never saw Africa as a market. All of a sudden, millions of people are getting cell phones and they didn't even have electricity. Then the electricity came. Build it and they will come. And what we learned is when you have no infrastructure, it's easier to start from scratch and build one than if you have to redo one where there's a lot of power interest in the way of you trying to reconstruct it. So China's been the big interesting thing for me. I was critical of China in the book, as you know. So I'm in Munich about two years ago, and I met, I'm with Deutsche Telekom, with a woman from Hong Kong, who's the CEO there, and she says, well, what do you think about what's going on with your book? I said, what are you talking about? She said, you don't know. What happened was, and this surprised me, someone named Wang Yang, who was premier of Guangdong, the biggest industrial region, on the Politburo, embraced the book. He's now on the 10-person Central Committee, and he's the vice premier of the economy. Then Premier Li, who you've been reading about, the new premier, they announced in December after he became into power that he read my book in English and he's instructed government agencies it's time. I was there in September and after I was there they, they put out three months later the National Grid of China an $82 billion four-year commitment to begin the energy internet. We're trying to raise seven billion over 20 years here. And they passed a, a constitutional amendment to the Chinese constitution which blew my mind because this is the most polluted country. It's very centralized, very top-down, but there's a generational shift. They're not sure how to do this. They're, you know, shooting, but they're dying from the pollution. The life expectancy is down five and a half years across northern China. This is real. This isn't academic for them. They passed a constitutional amendment. It's only the sixth one, I think, since the 1980s. And listen to this. They said all future economic development in our constitution 
must adhere to scientific principles. That's the laws of thermodynamics. And every economic development must adhere to the principles and prerequisites of ecology in order for it to be built. Can you imagine doing that in the U.S. That's an actual amendment to the Chinese, the Communist Party Constitution passed in November. Now, am I saying this is a rosy road? No. There's old interest there. There's big centralized government companies. There's a lot of who controls the Internet. All that stuff's going on. But isn't that amazing? But for them, it's survival. And I think there's a realization, 1.3 billion people, you can't do it with fossil fuels and centralized nuclear power plants. So it's a reality check. So now we have the EU, especially Germany, now France, now China. What's going on with the US? The US and Canada, the energy companies did a real number here. You know, when I come back and I see all these damn ads, I'm trying to go on the treadmill in the morning and I'm seeing that woman every day in the morning on natural gas. You see her, the one that goes around? Oh my God. So we have bought the idea that shale gas is going to free us and the pipeline is going to free us. Here's the reality in the industry. And we have a lot of energy and utility companies in my group. We know the reality of shale gas, and I'll share it with you. Andy Hall's the, probably the top oil guy in the world. He has a $4.5 billion hedge fund. He got it right. This is a bubble, like the gold rush in the 19th century. What's happened is they bought up all these shale deposits, okay? And all at once. And they're sucking out the sweet spot. Every big shale deposit has only one tiny sweet spot. They suck it out in 18 months. It's not like an oil, an oil well in Saudi Arabia. It goes on for 30 years, 18 months. They all bought in at the same time, so the natural gas price has gone way down, and they have a glut on the market. All right? But what Andy Hall says is this is actually going to peter out with, by the end of this decade. And now the International Energy Agency projects that the shale gas deposits will begin to level off in the late teens and then slowly go down. Tar sands in Canada, it's not competitive. I'm going to be in Edmonton in a couple of weeks with them again. We'll keep talking about this. It's not competitive under $80 a barrel, and it's climate change. So why would we stay in these old, polluting, costly energies when we can go to energy at near zero marginal cost and everyone can produce their own and share it with each other and address climate change and democratize the economy? This is a struggle for power. Literally, figuratively, this is a struggle for power. Okay, last, lastly. I don't think it's enough to have the technology. This technology revolution is not rocket science. As my wife says, it took all of you masters of the universe 25 years to figure this out. She's pretty tough. She said, uh, Obviously, we have to get off fossil fuels, so we go to renewables, because that's what we have plenty of. Obviously, with renewables, you have to collect them. And if they're everywhere, you collect them everywhere you have human infrastructure. And we know they're intermittent, so you have to store them. And you can't just go it alone, because if you don't have the sun shining, you need somebody else who has the wind blowing. So you have to put in an energy internet, and then you want to share it with each other and plug it into transport. She said, why would that have taken 20 years? <laughs> and when you put it that way, it is shameful, actually. But our I don't know a plan B to these five pillars. Where are my business people here that are in energy and stuff? Do you know of a plan B? If there is, I guess it's going back to tar sands and centralized energies and telecommunication in the 20th century. That doesn't sound so good to me. It's a losing proposition. But even with a good plan, we're not going to get there unless we have a shift in the narrative. We got to change consciousness up here in one generation that separates the grandparents, the grandchildren, and the grandchildren in the room. We have to shift from a geopolitical frame of reference to biosphere consciousness in two generations, quickly. The biosphere is the sheath from the stratosphere to the ocean depths where all living and geochemical processes interact in a very complex choreography to maintain the stability of life on this little oasis in the universe. It's so complex we haven't even begun to understand how this operates. It operates like an organism. It's not an organism, but it operates in a rich choreographic complexity. I'm guardedly hopeful because our kids are beginning to get to bounce for consciousness. It's, it's, it's incredible, really. It's informal in the schools. If it had been formalized in the curriculum, the Texas alone would have knocked it out 10 years ago, but it's happening teacher by teacher. You follow me? It's not in the textbooks. <laughs> you can't spy on every classroom. So what's happened is there are kids coming home from school all over the world now, 
and they're saying to their parents, they're saying to their dad, why are you using so much water there while you're shaving? They're the little ecological police. <laughs> why is the TV on? There's no one watching the TV. You're wasting electricity. Why do we have two cars? Can't we car share one? It's cool. We got a car, smart car. We'll do it. And this is the one that's dear to me. My wife and I are very engaged in animal rights issues as, as, as part of the environmental movement. There are young boys and girls coming home and they're saying, where'd that hamburger come from on the table? I'm serious. It's just happening all over the world. Did this come from a tropical rainforest in Central America? Did they have to wipe out the tree line for four inches of topsoil for four years of grazing for the cow for my burger? And the kids are connecting the dots. They're saying to their parents, when they knock down the trees to graze the cows, what happened to the rare species of life that only exist in that particular tree canopy? Extinction. And the kids are connecting the dots further. They say, well, wait a minute. Trees absorb CO2 from industrial climate change. So if the trees are eliminated to graze the cow for my burger, there's more CO2 going up. It's not being absorbed back in by the trees. And that means the temperature is going up. And so some farmer 20,000 miles away from me, she can't feed her kids because she's got floods and droughts because of the hamburger. These kids are learning ecological footprint. This is a new metric. We never had this 30 years ago. We can actually measure each thing we do all day long. I'm sure you do it in your classes. And what your footprint and my footprint is in relationship to the biocapacity of the planet. We can easily measure it. You can go up on the website. So the kids are learning that everything we do all day and all night when we're sleeping, every activity we engage in has an intimate impact on some other human, some other family, some other creature, some other ecosystem. And we're all in one system. That's why this third industrial revolution, Internet of Things, allows us to actually begin to reconnect in one neural network, see ourselves as a species connected, not just with each other, but with our fellow creatures. So whereas the first and second industrial revolution technology platforms divided us and allowed us to privatize the commons and take advantage of it in terms of private property relations, we got a lot out of it. This new system allows us to actually recapture the commons, integrate ourselves back into the planet's ecosystems, and create a more sustainable world, if we can pull it off. We need biosphere consciousness. Lastly, here in Cincinnati, I've been impressed by the initiatives that have been taking place here, both in the city level and at this university. And I, I, as my wife says, I'm not a great inflator. What you're doing here at this university at Xavier is quite interesting. You're crossing the disciplines. You're introducing sustainability. You're talking about shifting your physical plant into the new era. And you're preparing students for a new era. What's happening now with this Internet of Things? It's creating a new economic system. Capitalism is going to be here for a long time. But as more and more goods and services become nearly free, and as a prosumer, you can create your own goods and services and share it with each other at near zero marginal cost, you're spending more time now on a new economic paradigm. You're up on the commons. You're up there sharing on a collaborative commons on the internet. And when you're, you're maybe car sharing, you're couch surfing, you're sharing clothes, and you're sharing energy, and you're sharing 3D printed products on the social commons. You know, we think there's only two ways to run economy, either government or the capitalist system. We short shift the third alternative. There's another system on this planet. It's called the social commons, sometimes the civil society, the not-for-profit sector. It's a big player. It addresses all of our most intimate needs. It includes our educational institutions, our health services, our producer and consumer cooperatives, our credit unions, our uh, advocacy groups, our environmental organizations. And this is what creates the social capital of culture. This is what creates a sharing society. This is our bedrock. Eliminate that sector. And the capitalist market and government would disappear because they have to feed off that social capital and trust. Eliminate that sector. The Russians tried to do that in Eastern Europe. And the countries that could keep their nonprofit and their third sector in place were able to weather the storm, like Poland. Others had a tougher time. So what I'm suggesting is that the, we're going to increasingly see a hybrid economy, part capitalist market, part collaborative commons. It's already emerging, the sharing economy. How many of you have shared? Uh, maybe uh, couch surfing or Airbnb, or you've shared um, bikes, or you've shared threads up, or any. How many have shared something on the commons already? You're, that's not on the capitalist market. So we're going to be living in two spaces: capitalist market, 
because there will be goods and services where the profit margins are still there. But increasingly, goods and services, they move towards zero and potentially free. You can produce and share them with each other on a collaborative commons. This is exciting. It allows us to live in two worlds. It allows us to begin to make the transition so that we start to live in a world of sustainable abundance. And we change the dream from individual autonomy and being rich to sustainable life and having a good sense of community and passing on our legacy in a way that we can be proud of to our kids. Started here in Cincinnati. You've got a good base here at this university. Invite your, your basketball foes over at the University of Cincinnati to join with you here at Xavier and start moving this community forward in Ohio, the heartland, the heartland. This isn't about blue and red, last thought. Let me tell you, I grew up on right, left, capitalism versus socialism, who owns the means of production, how is it being distributed? There isn't a millennial in this world that talks about that on the internet. Their sense of power relationships is from a different paradigm. They ask, how does this institutional behavior behave, whether it's a government, a political party, a business, or a school? Is the institutional behavior top-down, centralized, patriarchal, closed, and proprietary, or is the institutional behavior open, transparent, distributed, collaborative, and peer-oriented, correct? That's the shift from vertical integrated power, economic political power, to lateral peer-to-peer -peer power. Power to the people. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just invite them to the mics and give it back to them. Wow. That's what I have to say to Mr. Rifkin. Um, there are mics set up, I believe, right here in the aisle. Is there just one or are there two? Just one. So line up quick so you can get your question in. And uh, we have at least a good uh, 15 to 20 minutes for questions. And he's graciously agreed to, to answer them. So let's go. This is on. Oh, now it is? Um, Hi, I wanted to invite you and everybody here, April 8th at Duke Convention Center, the LEAD building program is going to be showcased. Um, Cincinnati has some of the highest number of LEAD schools uh, any urban district in the country. And I wondered if you'd say a little bit about um, the pace of change that we really are encountering with all of what you've talked about tonight. Because it seems to me we have a, a tremendous need to really come to grips with how much we have to change and how difficult that process can be. Let's take the LEED standards. Great, the LEED's uh, operation is terrific, but now we got to go to the next stage of LEEDs. The first stage is get them efficient, seal them, retrofit them, increase the energy efficiencies, and build for efficiency. Absolutely essential. But now we got to go to the next stage. Put the installations on the building so you have your own micro power, and then connect up with micro grids across neighborhoods so that we can share energy like we share information. That hasn't happened yet. It's just on the cusp now. That's where we need to go. Absolutely. So here at the university, you're doing energy efficiency across the university. But now, seal it up, retrofit it, get it recycled, create a circular economy, and then get the installations on so that you are powering a near zero marginal cost and set up the infrastructure here, those five pillars. Uh, speaking as an individual, and a business a good owner. start. Yeah, good start. And a business owner. Tell me the one thing I would do in both of those roles to further the, our, my personal movement to your third revolution. One thing. I think that uh, I think human beings are storytellers. We live by narrative. I mean, in many ways, we're finding we're really not, we, have, we're, we may be different in degree, but not in kind, at least from our fellow mammals. They nurse their young. They pass on a certain amount of culture. They learn by experience. They have certain kind of empathic regard, or at least some kind of emotional response. Any mammal that nurses their young. So we're learning, and they communicate in many ways. They groom, they socialize. The one difference is we have language, and we live by our narratives and our metaphors, and we tell each other stories, and then those stories become our reality. The thing missing here is not just what are our list of projects we can do. The story I told tonight is common sense. This is not rocket science. We need to share the narrative because millions of Americans are without a narrative. And they're desperately clinging on to very old kind of either Ayn Rand, libertarian myths from the 50s, 
Uh, I don't know what they are. It's just bizarre. And we need to begin to start thinking, no, seriously, in a new narrative about the human race as a species, about how we can come together and connect. And every young person on Facebook is becoming much more global. They're beginning to see, they're, no, they're, they're beginning to remove themselves from the parochialisms of the past, the xenophobisms, and they're beginning to perceive each other as human beings across all the boundaries. And now, thank God, we're beginning to see our fellow creatures as part of our evolutionary family. This is good stuff. So I would say the first thing is to share the narrative. Talk about the possibility and the hope that we can do better. We're an empathic creature. We can create a sense of biosphere consciousness, learn to live together in a humane, sustainable way and create a good quality of life. Pass that narrative along. It isn't just about the technology. It's about how we want to live together on this planet and what we think the human journey ought to be about. Hi. Um, I read your book. Um, I've actually digested. Did you tell my family that? Because they won't read any of my books. Really? <laughs> well, I, <laughs> That's kept, the truth. I kept going back to passages in your book. The social commons is the part that really uh, I think is critical because I'm looking at the political structures that we have in place, you know, the war that's going on right now, the power struggle. Um, almost everyone that is involved with um, trying to raise biosphere consciousness is usually in some form of a 501c3, which is hamstrung politically. They can't get involved. The only group I've been able to find so far in this area that can get in there and endorse candidates um, and our primary structure, too, that's a place where we're getting railroaded by the system because the red and blue ideologues are putting in candidates on the tickets that don't have ecological consciousness. But the other problem I see is that, um, you know, you've got the, the political system's been co-opted by groups like ALEC um, so that people don't really know the truth about where these candidates are coming from yeah. and how they've already been bought off by these corporate interests. Have you been watching this new CNN series? I'm surprised they're doing it, where they're, they're actually following all the lobbyists. Have you haven't watched this? I, I'm shocked they're doing this. They're, they must be losing commercial sponsors. It won't go on for long, so you better watch it. They actually have an investigative team, CNN, is on every week, and they're following congressmen, congresswomen, their families, how they're fundraising all day, showing them in their private moments doing this, and how they're all connected, Democrats and Republicans, in one big machine for money. It is, no, yeah. no one's seen this on CNN? It's horrible. All right. Let me say, what's interesting here, people ask, why is this happening in Europe and not here, this movement? In Europe, the, the companies are there. And they do have an influence. And some of the same companies there have to operate differently than here because right. all the elections are publicly financed. Exactly. So they can't sit and write the legislation. I, I know. I'm there every day with these leaders. And they're there at the table. But so are the civil society. The NGOs play a big role. The regions, localities, the member yeah. states. So there's so many varied interests. It's a network. It's excruciating. It's democratic. It takes longer. And sometimes you think, well, they're not making decisions. But that's what democracy is about. It takes right. longer, but they at least have collegiality and no one can run the show. Right. Obviously, that Supreme Court decision was disgraceful and shameful. Yes. And um, I'm glad that the one thing Obama did is stare down Roberts and say, how dare you? It was outrageous. It's just, we've, I've lived in Washington 45 years. My wife says, why are we there so long? I don't know. <laughs> you get the mortgage and you're stuck. Um, but I've seen in my lifetime, in my lifetime, the complete takeover of this country by the special corporate yes. lobbies. It's disgraceful. And I got to say, Ralph Nader's an old friend. I bless his heart. He's totally right. Completely right. And when his history is written, he told us, yeah. you got to have the, the electoral reform. And the reforms they put in just allow them to do legally, they call it electoral reform, that does legally what they were doing illegally before. <laughs> Both parties. So what yes. I'd say is, We've got, to, we've got to stop this. I, we have got to really find a way to address the question of corporations being able to finance yes. the government of this country. This is not good. I could put a political label on it, but you put your own on it, okay? Um, the other thing I wanted to say real quickly is I know right now there's a constitutional uh, challenge occurring right now yeah. where a lot of independent voters from independentvoter.org and there's uh, another group that got together 
They are challenging primaries that independents have to pay for primaries where you have to be either yeah. a Republican or a Democrat yeah. in order yeah. to vote in the primaries. Well, what I'm saying, that's part of the puzzle. But here's what I would say to you. Aside from the political process, at the local level, in cities, in counties, it's much less about politics. It's more about development. How do we get this economy moving? How do we create jobs? How do we create a better quality of life? So you'll see local politicians around the country, elected officials, mayors, county officials, they've got to address the real issues, and it's much less polarized at the local level. You have to bring together the civil society, the not-for-profit sector, the commercial sector, and local government, and the academic community, and begin the developments. When we've done master plans collaboratively in the world, we've really done a lot of cities and regions. Countries are a little tough. You can do that here, independent of what goes on in Washington, and move this forward. And eventually, as you move it forward, you have a new model. And nothing succeeds like success. You've got a model that creates jobs near zero marginal cost energy. You are a, a, uh, a leader in 3D printing. You've created a biosphere valley, and they will come. And you won't have to sit there and worry about Washington because it will happen here. Because I think it's going to be tough to do it the other way. Start here and start building the Cincinnati Biosphere Valley. So I just had a quick question. You were talking about how there's not really a plan B to those five pillars for the EU. Um, what, do you have, what do you think about the viability of nuclear fusion as an energy source now that it, for the first time in human history, uh, we've created in the laboratory a fusion reaction that actually put out more energy than what was put in. Yeah, I looked at that. When you look at the fine print, it's a, very, it's a little bit similar to the fine print we've seen every time this has been announced. Go look at the fine print about how, what was really created there. I'm, I'm, I'm for trying things that work, but we've been dealing with fusion now for 40 years. It may at some point happen. It isn't now. But what I'm saying is, and you can get the sun for free and everyone can share energy, why would you want to concentrate on a more centralized power source even if it's, if it's gain? It makes no sense because we can get to zero marginal cost and everyone providing energy in 20 years all over the world. It's here. The wind, the sun, the heat on the ground. Why not go for that? Let the fusion continue on. I wouldn't say no, but when you have an energy source that's abundant and everywhere and distributed and available to everybody for near zero marginal cost, there's something wrong when you just don't go for it. I guess you would say there's something dysfunctionally wrong. I want to thank you for one thing, for, for talking about food. Um, it is true that in 2008, with the passage of our Green Cincinnati Plan, we became the first city in the world to recommend reduced meat consumption to slow global warming. Uh, the year after that, uh, World Watch Institute published a report by a couple scientists, uh, ecologists for the, world, for the World Bank, as a matter of fact, and uh, they were tracing uh, you were talking about sec ranked second, right, ranked first. They said that anthropogenic global warming's 51% uh, of the cause of human source global warming was meat production. Yeah. Huge. I think it's probably, it'll probably get higher when they start looking at the stats. And the same year, the, the head of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said the most important thing we can do to slow global warming is to stop eating meat. Yeah. Now, um, that's, that's just... Can that. I ask, how many read Beyond Beef? the book I put out in 1990. You know, the cattle industry actually went berserk. They stopped the tour. They, they, were, they were threatening and everything. They said, how could cow farts have anything to do with this? You know? <laughs> and and it, it's uh, cow I saw it's, it's, it's poetic <laughs> justice um, that after this 20-some years later, we're now getting all the reports and the issues in. And you know what? We're, we're, we're not carnivores. We're not herbivores. We're omnivores. But omnivores can make a choice to be a carnivore, an omnivore, or a herbivore. Is, uh, look, I'm not Mother Teresa. I'm not a full vegan. I try my best over 30 years. Just try a little. Good for us. Good for our health. Good for our fellow creatures. Good for the planet. It's a win. That's all. You know, I'm always amazed at people that get so angry when they hear you're a vegetarian. I mean, they get more anger or that you love animals. I'm always amazed at the most fear and the most anger that I ever see was when someone expresses some empathy for a fellow creature or for being a vegetarian. Is there something wrong with a society that's geared toward that? We have to rethink it. Maybe that's why we have all the guns. Let's so the, 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 the question, the question is unrelated. The question is about the internets. You talked about the three internets. And um, 
and that they, when they mature, they sort of merge into a single internet yeah, of things. They are now. Um, here's my question. With information, say Wikipedia, with information so widely shared and so available, what you used to have with the centralized systems was, was a method that sort of determined quality yeah. before it reached us. Yeah. Will the, will the sort of uneven quality, will it create a less efficient, in some ways, less efficiency? Well, you know, the argument I've heard counter that, you know, uh, Ortega Gasset once wrote a book called The Revolt of the Masses, where he said that, well, actually, if you democratize culture, it would be terrible because it will go to the least common denominator. It's a pretty elitist book. A lot of people loved it. Uh, I would say, I agree with those who say when you, everyone has an equal chance to be heard in some way and get their ideas out, the best ideas will come forth. Now there'll be a lot of silly stuff too. Uh, where my, uh, my critique of the internet is of a different nature, which is that every other communication energy revolution history, every other communication revolution history deepened our ability to use metaphors and create more vocabulary so we could express the nuances of our feelings to each other in much more uh, individual ways. If you look at the history of empathic evolution, as I did in the book, these in empathic civilization, each communication revolution allowed greater storage. If you were in a formulaic culture, an oral culture, and you're feeling pain, I would just give back an aphorism to you, you know, like grandma did. So it may not actually address what you're feeling or your joy, but that's as close as I can get. As we went to print and novels and all of that, we could express more words, more metaphors. What's happened now, unfortunately, with the internet is it allows us to have much more communication at near zero marginal cost, but we're narrowing vocabulary in the process. That's the dumbing down factor. That's the danger. And what we're seeing is um, the National Endowment for the Arts study of about four or five years ago, I think it was, uh, concluded that uh, reading, writing, comprehension has gone down by one third in college graduates in the US. And that's because when you're on, if you're reading a magazine, even a crappy magazine or a book, you have more rare words per thousand words than when you're watching TV and even fewer on the internet. While all the words are up on the internet, there are, because of the, the stimulation and the attention span narrows because the stimulation increases, so you have to move with more brevity and use fewer words to express yourself to keep moving on the treadmill. So my, my real critique there is we've got a tremendous communication medium that can neurally connect the human race so that everybody can be in touch with everyone and everything and every creature. But we need to find a way in our educational system to be able to use that in a way that it broadens our ability to use metaphors, increase vocabulary, and be able to express ourselves. Uh, I'll, I'll let, lead with this. I'll finish with this on his thought. Henry David Thoreau. Now listen, he went home every weekend. His mother did his laundry, so he didn't have it that rough. But Henry, just an aside, but Henry David Thoreau once said, we now have the telegraph, so Maine can talk to Texas. The question is, does Maine have anything of relevance to say to Texas? <laughs> so what I'm saying is, let's fast, fast forward to tonight. We've really got to ratchet up our, uh, the potential of this internet, and it starts in grade school with creating a collaborative, distributed classroom, critical thinking, and all the things you're introducing at the university level, we have to start introducing at preschool. So let's move a little quicker if we can, because okay. I, I think they're getting nervous here. And no, no first comment, then questions, yeah. all right? I can see how to just. So my okay. question is. Because um, I'll go on all night, and you'll be here till 3 in the morning. <laughs> I'm, an, I'm, an, I'm an MBA student here at Xavier, and I'm involved with a group that's trying to create a sustainable ecosystem yeah. of businesses here. One of the first technologies we've uh, targeted is sort of vertical agriculture, mm -hmm. vertical farming, urban ag. It's a company called Waterfields are in operation here. What is your experience with this technology in your interactions with the EU and uh, various government bodies and other, you know, large corporations? Well, you know, I was gonna. I had a whole section on vertical farming in the new book and didn't put it in. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the book's coming out in two weeks. I, I did put in uh, community uh, association farming, where consumers get together with the farmers, pay up front a season ahead of time. And then I like that, because that's a cooperation. That's a shared commons. It's a little bit of a, it's not really a market economy, where 
consumers come together on the internet, they work with the farmers, they pay up front, they get the produce. If, the, if there is a bad harvest, they share the loss. If there's a good harvest, they share the gain. They're prosumers. I like it. Vertical farming is very interesting, too. Uh, I'm for uh, pursuing vertical farming. Uh, that's where you farm indoor and you use very little inputs and you're able to get the outputs. We may have to go to that because climate change may move us to that point where we're going to have to do indoor vertical farming. So, yeah, I think that's up and coming. I, I encourage it as long as it's sustainable and ecologically uh, sound. I also think we have to find a way to rest our soil. We, you know, the reason we don't get more farmers moving organic, I mean, Whole Foods is going crazy, but it takes seven years to detoxify that soil. And our ag department will not subsidize to detox for the seven years so they can keep the old, they, they keep Monsanto and everybody in, in business. Do you follow me? So if we're doing a little vertical farming, it'll allow us to lay the land fallow. I guess the Bible does talk about that, doesn't it? Lay the land fallow so that we can rejuvenate and rewild. We need to rewild. We need to rejuvenate. We need to give our fellow creatures a little break here and let them come back. When I was 10. We'll do three quick. Everyone 10 I was, when I was 10, was 10 I, I you know, heard about how it was sort of like capitalism versus the environment. And then when the fall of the Berlin Wall, I saw like uh, communism was a lot worse, that a lot worse standard of living. Uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, and you know, we, we still have you know problems in that nature. That you know, in terms of like the third world becoming second and first world now, and, and the places like Africa and India. Where, where well, uh, uh, let me say that the Soviet Union. They're getting cars. They're getting beef. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand. If yeah, the, the Soviet Union was a failed system. Didn't work. Couldn't work. It was a disgrace. However. Let me say, I'm quite shocked at what's going on in my own country because in 1960, we were the most middle class country in the world. And whatever your political beliefs, I grew up in the, in the south side of Chicago, public school. I grew up with the American dream. We had a working class community. People had a good life. They were working the steel mills and the meat packing plants, and they had a good life. What I've seen happen, and it really started with deregulation with uh, Reagan and Thatcher all the way to Clinton and Bush. And there was just this grab by the business community to take one last lucrative largesse, all the government services, and privatize them for the market with almost no discussion. Some of it should have been privatized, but not all of it. It's not that our government services weren't doing a good job with, in countries with world-class uh, uh, television like BBC and postal services that worked and garbage collection and sewage systems and public schools. But the deregulation allowed us to go to the other extreme where everything was the market. And then we lost the balance. You have to have a market because you want to stimulate entrepreneurial spirit. But if the market's all by itself and there's no check, it goes wild and it's winner take all. So today, 500 companies represent one third of the GDP of the world, 500 companies. On the other hand, if you have a Soviet system, it's just big daddy and a nanny state, you lose individual initiative and you live in, in, a, in a, a very dull and, and difficult world. I'm always for Aristotelian balance. In Europe, every election's about how far we should rebalance. Too much market, go back to more state. Too much state, go more back to the market. And the civil society is now becoming the, the centerpiece between the two. So I think that we need to try to understand that we live well if all three sectors are at the table. The civil society, the, mark, the business community, the government, and now a lot of the collaborative commons, a lot of that civil society is moving into the economic sphere. And let me just say, lest you think this is uh, small potatoes, the not-for-profit social commons, the civil society, is right now 5% of 5.5% of the GDP. But the nonprofits in the United States have grown by 25% in the last 11 years. For-profit companies have grown by six tenths of one percent. I think the figure is. Huh? I think that's the figure. Secondly, uh, the uh, 10% of the employment in the U.S., the U.K., Canada is now in the not-for-profit community. Third, people say, isn't this a parasitic community? It relies on government grants and philanthropy. No. A study done by Johns Hopkins Center for Civil Society of 40 countries shows that about 50% of all the revenue that uh, nonprofits have are fees for services. They're a contender. So we're going to see more and more employment migrate to that sector as we get more um, virtual uh, retailing and 
workerless factories and automated logistics, employment is really migrating quick to the social commons <clears throat> because that's where you create social capital. Machines can't do it. <clears throat> that's about human beings. So uh, understand that we have opportunities now to create a new possibility. The Internet of Things, it's the soulmate of a social commons because it's all about distributed, collaborative, laterally peer, te peer technology infrastructure that allows social capital to flourish and sharing to flourish. So there's an opportunity, there's a challenge, but it's going to be a hard fought to make sure that it's open, neutral, transparent, and that all of us can share uh, our destiny together and not be crippled by a few companies. Okay, last two. You mentioned uh, <coughs> fixed costs in your presentation. I'm just wondering if you can give an example of that and if it's above our willingness to pay that fixed cost. I'm sorry, you asked about fixed cost? Yeah, and if it's above our willingness to pay for that fixed cost. Uh, the, fixed cost have been, the fixed cost of introducing the first and second industrial revolution much more expensive than the fixed cost of introducing the third industrial revolution, be clear. You know how much the sensors cost? In the last 18 months, they've had breakthroughs in the sensors that you put in, six to 10 cents. They're just gonna be embedded in the product. It's not gonna affect much when you buy that product, that six to 10 cents, the appliance or whatever. So I would say that um, there are fixed costs. They're putting the energy internet's not gonna be cheap. What's happening in Europe is we've introduced feed-in tariffs, 61 countries now have. So you, if you put in an installation for solar or wind, geothermal, you get premium above market price for sending your energy to the grid. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the reason we're doing this is it helps subsidize to get the innovation and the scaling up. And it's, becomes, it's moved the innovation so quick that we can move the tariffs down within less than 20 years to zero. And what's ironic is the old energy companies gross about it. They're still being subsidized much higher for mature industries that have sunsetted. They're getting massive amounts of subsidy for nuclear, coal, energy, and they're the biggest companies in the world, and they are begrudging a small feed-in tariff which can actually uh, uh, move to parity and actually uh, end its course in less than 20 years. It's disgraceful. So, but we're gonna continue on. We're gonna make sure that this feed-in tariff goes to every country in the world. I really appreciate your comments about uh, logistics and, your, and you talked about them being one of the top three um, transformational yeah. areas. I'm in the process of uh, forming a, a transportation and logistics council here in greater Cincinnati. It's gonna be uh, based at Cincinnati State. And it's a industry trade organization focused on uh, not only skill development, workforce training, but also innovation and research. Just wondering if you can give me some insights on what we should focus on here in Cincinnati to really leverage um, that technology of logistics and transportation. It, this is a, another plug, unfortunately, but the new book has a whole section on it, on logistics. And the reason is, uh, this is new to us. We knew about logistics and transport to plug in, but what we're now talking about is uh, logistics and transport internet, okay? Meaning, that uh, logistics is the most inefficient of all the systems we have. We have trucks on the road that are using 20% of their cargo or they're going empty most of the trip. And we have warehouses that are either too full or nothing in them. So what, we're reckon, what I'm recommending, we're now doing some work with um, some of the major port facilities in the world. And our, we're bringing in our global teams to begin to deal with how do you create a logistics internet, meaning sensors and software and everything modulized by standards. That means that we have maybe, let's say you have 500,000 warehouses. <clears throat> They're all privately owned, and each one deals with one client. In the new system, we would put them all in a cooperative so that you could go to any one of those warehouses when they have open space. So instead of moving your truck 1,000 miles, you could go to the warehouse closest to where you're going to distribute it, and if they have open space, they're part of a cooperative. They could still be private enterprise, but cooperative networks. Therefore, you're working in a grid that allows you 500,000 distribution points, not just 10 or 12, and you can move your cargo so you don't have empty time, space. And you have to then standardize it all with the radio frequency so that it's modular, so anything you're sending is in the same container, the same radio bands, that can, so you can monitor the traffic on the Internet of Things and know where everything is at every moment, like Federal Express does for you now. They can tell you where it is. But that, therefore, you could create a continental logistics system with cooperatives, private enterprise and co-ops, that will allow us to be able to move quicker, 
and then move toward near uh, 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 driverless vehicles within 10, 15 years and continue to reduce the cost with electric vehicles and GPS. So that's where we're headed, I think, toward an, a logistics internet, cooperatives, everything network, everything can move anywhere in the system, and you can use uh, transport that's uh, uh, automated transport and, and power that's near zero marginal cost energy, you really reduce your logistics cost. So if you have that logistics internet with the energy internet and the information internet in one system, you can see how anyone in this room, let's say you're a small business person, you want to increase logistics, you create your own app, go in and get the big data on what's going on all around you within a thousand miles and you want to transport and ship and distribute, you can do the same thing. Know where to put it, what distribution house, when to, what warehouse, what freight to use. There's no reason you can't do it as an SME just like the big guys. So just like hundreds of millions of people now are sharing their own information just like the big, and you don't need the big media companies, and now we're going to do it with energy, we can do it with logistics too. And this should transpire over 20 years, not 40. If the internet's a model, the energy internet and logistics internet are moving around the same curve. 20 years, one generation. Started in Cincinnati. <laughs> let, me, let me first of all say that what we're doing here right now is social capital. Um, the fact of all of our partners, the Sustainability Committee, all of the ones that join us, the fact that you all are in this room um, is, is just an important symbol of what we're all doing. Let me remind you again, next week, same time as this, will be the town hall meeting on looking at how we apply some of these principles to Cincinnati. Come be part of that conversation because that's about us. And, how, and actually how we do this. Let me thank again the, the technical people for the work they do and the good work CentOS does. My assistant, Cynthia Cummins, who does a lot of our logistics that makes things run smoothly. Thank all of you all for being here tonight and taking time to care about this and to be part of this conversation. And once again, help me thank Jeremy Rifkin for his inspiration and his vision. Thank you.